very frankly, we have this evening a difficult subject. Because if we want to be strictly honest, we are dealing with a problem for which there are innumerable interpretations and about which there are countless convictions. But in order to transform these interpretations and these convictions into some structure that has specific boundaries, form, and outline is exceedingly difficult. We think of the term self as primarily applicable to the totality of our own being or nature. When the individual says, I, myself. He is telling us, in a strange way, that he is affirming a total nature, a total being, a total essence, and that this essence is the sum, sum and substance of his own existence. Our dictionary falls completely short of helping us because words have no real meaning beyond usage, and uh, usage has never been able to penetrate into these exceedingly abstract realms. We know beyond question of doubt that there is some kind of an existence in us. And in the previous discussions of this series, we have examined various aspects of what we might call the self-syndrome. We have tried to differentiate between various levels of cognition by which we recognize this self in us. And we have more or less come to the final conclusion that that which is recognized is not the reality. Another way where Lao Tzu uses the word Tao to signify this totality of being, he says the Tao which can be defined is not the Tao. The self that can be defined by the same way is not the true self. We know this true self in some mysterious way because it makes possible the activities of that which is not itself. We recognize it as a mysterious power that confers its energies and resources upon faculties, members, structures, and numerous attributes which are not identical with its own nature, but may be regarded as extensions of that nature. We are in much the same difficulty in the more realistic and scientific field of energy. We can tell something of what energy does. We can tell something about energy by its consequences. We become aware of the reality of energy by its inevitable presence in all things. Yet we are still at loss to adequately define its own nature. Our ancient brethren used the word life in many cases to signify this strange, vital existence which bestows from itself a certain quality upon all things which are dependent upon it or exist within it. We divide life into two general areas, 
organic and inorganic. We recognize organic life as being clearly expressive of life itself. And we recognize certain qualities which make up organic structures. We know that they possess powers, powers of accommodation, powers of reproduction, powers of growth, of assimilation. We also know that within life there must be certain archetypal processes inasmuch as all organic structures remain true to the essential types to which they belong. When we use life with a capital L, the dictionary tells us it is a synonym of God. When we use self with a capital S, it is a synonym of God. Uh, when we use almost any of these great terms of source or origin, such as existence or being or reality or truth, and we capitalize these terms, they become synonyms of deity. Thus, in the end, we unite all of our concepts of value in the concept of divine being. In our present time, where science is inclined to reject theological interpretations of things, it is not common to see such terms as life or nature or being or essence uh, capitalized in the sense that they become synonyms of any form of transcendental creature or existence. However, as we explore into our own natures, we discover that we can remove layer upon layer of conditioned existence, and yet the unconditioned source of existence remains. We cannot say that self is identical with consciousness, or with mind, or with thought, or emotion, or activity, but we do recognize that all of these processes arise within the nature of something. We are unable to accommodate ourselves to the concept that behind this vast structure there is no integrated causal factor. Lao Tse, who was so astute in many things, used our rather familiar element of water as a means of expressing or explaining life. The ancients were already aware of man's strange dependency upon water that in a way we are dependent upon light and water for existence, for survival. Without water, the seed will not germinate. Without water, the soil becomes barren and sterile. And all creatures together are dependent upon this element for the development and survival of their own intricate and contrasting natures. But water is something in common in organic structures. So Lao Tse contemplated the idea that we could use water as a symbol for a life essence. We know that in the New Testament, Jesus uses this concept of the waters of life, and the waters of everlastingness. The Egyptians had the same opinion about it. So that one aspect of life has been the universal diffusion of nutrition, that everything is nourished or sustained by something that can bestow nourishment and sustenance. Yet we cannot say that a life is water. We cannot say 
that water is self. But in some way, we can get the feeling from the symbolism of water that there are diffused energies, powers, or principles by means of which organic structures are sustained. And we know, theoretically at least, that inorganic structures must also be in some way sustained, although perhaps not in quite the manner with which we think of sustenance. In the Oriental systems, Buddhism and Hinduism, there are certain points of view that are worth considering. Both the Hindu and the Buddhist recognized a certain illusionary kind of existence. They held definitely that the personality or the individuality with which we are uh, aware or with which we are acquainted is not the true self. They recognize that the personality, the individual as he is here in his daily living, is not merely a complete reflection or manifestation of the total selfness behind him. In some way, this self, deeper than thought, deeper than intuition, deeper than instinct, older than any manifestation that we can uh, think of or cause to arise within imagination, deeper than any of these things, there is an enduring fact, a fact of aliveness. This fact of aliveness in specialized creatures has specialized manifestation. The individual can not only be aware of himself in a sort of dim, shadowy way, but he can be aware of other selves. He can come to realize that he lives in a world of beings each of these beings dimly aware of an innate selfness. Yet there seems to be no causal bridge between these, no mysterious nexus that binds them together. In each instance, the self remains recondite, difficult to approach, and separate. We are not able to suddenly become another person. We are not able to share in the internal experiences of other people. We cannot find a point in which consciously we experience our self as the self of someone else, or for that matter, anyone else's self as identical with our own. Vedanta and other Indian philosophies affirm, however, the existence of one self, and that this one self animates all of the different individualities, this infinite sequence of being suspended from being. These same people affirm it to be mystically true to be experienced by certain meditational processes that we can transcend individuality, that we can reach a condition or point in which we are no longer constantly aware that we exist as totally isolated creatures. By meditational disciplines of yoga or Vedanta, the individual seems to experience himself as coming nearer and nearer to a universal reality, subjective, not necessarily distant, but certainly obscure as far as, as, as his objective consciousness is concerned. Yet it is very doubtful that even the Vedantic or yogic mystic 
has ever reached a state of consciousness in which he has experienced an identity with another person. He may have experienced what he feels to be an identity with deity. And he affirms that this identification must inevitably cause him to be one with all other living things. But this identity does not cause him to become instantly aware of his brother's pain. He can intellectually be aware of it. He can experience it as occurring in his own consciousness. But it is something which he himself has fashioned. He can say to himself, I have suffered. I have suffered as my neighbor has suffered. Therefore, I know his suffering, and in the quietude of meditation, I can re-experience my own suffering and become intuitively aware that he is in a similar condition. But what he is actually doing in his meditation is creating a sympathetic interpretation in his own nature. He is not actually this other person. He is trying to feel the need of this other person. And if he reaches a high degree of proficiency in this, he becomes an exceedingly compassionate being. With a continuing remembrance of the limitations and imperfections of himself, therefore continually charitable of the limitations and imperfections of others. Thus he may gain a certain insight which may be termed an extension of consciousness. He becomes acutely aware of other needs, but he is rescuing uh, uh, this awareness from the needs of himself. He is reviving the story of his own pain and becoming capable of re-experiencing it when he thinks of the pain of someone else. But we do not have any evidence or record that this individual, even in his meditation, can actually become identical with another separate existing being. He can be or affirm himself to be identical with the source of life. But here again, through the very experiences through which we have passed, This identification is difficult to analyze. The mystical is always almost impossible to examine in the terms of the so-called factual or ordinary or traditional. Yet we do possess something that seems to be capable of being approached Uh, being held in awareness. So perhaps one of the ways we can come nearest to this is trying to retrace or follow in the footsteps of some yogic discipline, trying to discover, if we can, uh, the nature of that which is the ultimate goal of the human endeavor. We have to affirm that man is finally dedicated to the one pursuit which can ever actually satisfy his insatiable desire to learn and to grow and to know. Man, know thyself. Thus, all other forms of knowledge seem to in some way bear upon this essential search for pure knowing, the knowing of self. If we start then with the Buddhist or Vedantist mystic, we realize the path that he attempts to follow. First of all, he must in one way or another break away from the traditional patterns of definition which we associate with life itself. 
If this mystic was bound to the dictionary, he would fail before he starts. If he was bound to the common definitions of things, which are experienced even by his own mind, he could not hope to transcend the ordinary, or that which is truly uh, merely the continuance of the conditioned state in which he now exists. So the mystic in the beginning recognizes the necessity of stepping across from one state of being to another. He attempts to do this first by disentangling that part of himself which he calls the Noah from that part of himself which cannot know. He tries to liberate mental energy from mental process. He tries to liberate emotional energy from emotional process. And he tries to liberate physical energy from physical process. He recognizes that the physical as the channel for life principles becomes a container which shapes and often distorts and certainly dilutes the activities of the forces moving through it. So the search for the unconditioned state of being must be attained or must be advanced by the gradual, voluntary sublimation of conditions themselves. This is why uh, development or growth can never be merely a formal exercise. Uh, the formal exercise will add skill to process, but it will not transcend process. The mystic is attempting constantly uh, to liberate that which is from that which seems to be that which has a total existence from that which manifests only as a conditioned existence. He is out uh, in the quest of the unconditioned, where he knows that the unconditioned must be at the source of all conditioned reflex of every kind in every level and area of existence. He therefore begins by detaching his awareness in every possible way that he can from its addictions to illusion or fallacy. Recognizing that he is essentially an eternal being, he seeks to reestablish his consciousness of this eternal truth. To do this, he must overcome innumerable secondary, modifying expressions of his intelligence. He seeks to relax away from the physical world. Not that he intends to die, but he intends to liberate physical energy from the conditions with which it has become associated. His idea of relaxation in this case is merely uh, to restore a complete normalcy, uh, to remove all pressure, stress, symptoms. He does this by the purification of his body. He does this uh, by the gradual integration of his physical purposes. He gradually divides his desires from his needs. He simplifies in every possible way body existence. If this simplification is carried to its ultimate or to a near ultimate, the individual experiences his ability to be, become unaware of body. This does not mean he neglects it, but he me it means he becomes unaware of it as a conditioning factor of consciousness. He therefore can, as in yoga, experience the state of existing in space, uh, unaware of body. He is no longer a person with hands and feet. 
He is a condition of consciousness. The body still exists. He can draw his attention to it at will. But when he does not so focus his attention upon body and cause the various energies of life to stimulate body reflexes, he is just simply not aware of body. The moment he is not aware of body, he discovers that in a strange, mysterious way, he is no longer aware of the physical universe in which he lives. He becomes consciousness inhabiting space. He is no longer aware of time or place. He finds himself timeless and placeless, but at the same time in a place at a time. He then goes on to the next problem of sublimation, and that is to sublimate emotional intensities. He finds that he lives not only in a physical world with boundaries, but in an emotional sphere which also has set and fixed rules by means of which his emotional energies manifest themselves in traditional ways. He finds desire. He finds self-interest, self-mess. He finds the impulse of ambition or possession. He experiences the immediacy of emotional attitude, pleasure, pain, misery. He experiences his relationship to life as emotional. If something is extremely wonderful, he may experience it with sadness. He may find himself contemplating deity as Dante did and bursting into tears. He finds the emotional equation there. And this emotional equation is a constant stirring up of conditioned attitudes. So he seeks the sublimation of emotion. He seeks to attain desirelessness, not because he wishes to be less. And this is the problem that the non-mystic is always concerned over. The non-mystic feels that if he does not desire, he is emotionally dead. This is not true. The suspension of desire is in a strange way the fulfillment of all desiring inasmuch as separate desires rising from a common desiring are insatiable in their demands. But to be relieved of the separate pressures is some, in some way to become aware of the total meaning of desire itself, to penetrate its conditions and discover the essence or substance of the desire energy. If he is able to quiet his desires so that he finds the, a tranquility or peace within himself, he then discovers that the world of objective desires, of sensory desires, gradually fades out, just as the physical world faded out when he relieved his consciousness of the burden of body. As his desires go to sleep, in meditation or quietude. He therefore experiences the opposite of the state of desire, and that is peace itself. The whole of space suddenly becomes completely peaceful because all of the pressures which he experienced arose within himself and were communicated to him uh, from within by a subtle mechanism. Uh, which we call this process of the machine of the sensory perceptions. These uh, perceptions work from within and from without. So if the mystic or yogi is able to quiet desire, he lives in a universe of quietude, a universe of peace. 
But this is not his end. He must go one step more at least, and that is he must find some way of sublimating the mental process. Now, this is the most difficult naturally, because we have only the mind with which to achieve this sublimation. Yet the mystic is convinced that mental individualization also sets up conditioned existence. That as the individual thinketh, so is he. That the mind is subject to its own peculiar intemperances and intolerances. One of the problems that the mind is always facing is this desperate process of rationalization. The mind, in order to accept, must be able to make the objects of its acceptance reasonable to itself. The mind, therefore, sets up a kind of censorship, and it demands answers. In a way, probably, the scientific thinker is the most complete flowering of the pure process of mind. For philosophy represents mind combined with certain deeply emotional factors. But in pure science, the search for pure fact, a search using only certain standardized means which have been set up as categories of procedure. This is the mental way of doing things. The mind must find explanations, and it must find explanations in terms that are comprehensible to itself. These explanations must not in any way conflict with the mind, or it will not accept them. So the mind, in a way, shortens or lengthens the facts to its own peculiar standards of measurement. The measuring, estimating, reconciling, synthesizing processes of the mind finally manifest in what we like to call higher criticism, which doesn't mean that we're simply out criticizing people. Higher criticism simply means the application of mental laws to mental problems and the determination of the individual to be true to the mind when an emergency arises between, we will say, thought and emotion. This process of mental examination would cause us to naturally desire to put the universe in order as a system of factual processes, structures, and laws. This putting the universe in order, however, transcends our ability. We cannot. We cannot even fully grasp the detail of order. We sense the totality, but we cannot analyze the process. And the mind, frustrated in its analysis, loses face, loses caste, and loses orientation. The mystic, therefore, must proceed to this point in which he is no longer dependent upon the mind to provide him with the assurances of reality. As the emotions quiet it down to create a peaceful state based very largely upon a total unquestioning adjustment or acceptance, so the mind must likewise be brought to this state of tranquility which represents the, the suspension of all specialized mental attitudes. And as the mind is a structure of specialized attitudes, the moment these are no longer encouraged, as long as this process of mental dissection of phenomena is not sustained, the mind reaches a point where it likewise has only the rudimentary realization of the suspension of its own nature, which ends at also 
in mental tranquility. The mind, no longer seeking to know, finds peace. It is all. It is always hoped that it would find its peace in knowing everything. But it doesn't go, uh, take long in the course of growth to realize that the mind is not going to know everything. To suddenly confront this fact with hopelessness is a complete frustration of man's natural searching. He must have a different attitude in which the mind neither condemns him for his limitations or itself for its own inabilities and ineffectiveness. So in the yoga, the mind also is brought into a state of total suspension. When we have this chain of vehicles all in a state of suspension, what do we have left? We have apparently one thing left, namely we have the power by which we brought these physical, mental, emotional factors into a state of non-aggression. Theoretically, if we bring anything to a state of absolute equilibrium, that thing can no longer change itself. If equilibrium is attained, we take the dynamic out of this quality or force that is brought to balance. Once a thing is, uh, is balanced, it cannot of itself destroy its own balance. Therefore, something else must destroy it. It must be in some way subjected to a conditioning situation. Now, the point that we want to make is this. When the physical body, the emotional nature, and the mental nature are all brought to equilibrium, the individual does not die. This means that there is a power separate from these things which can break the equilibrium. After a certain length of time, something causes the individual to determine to return again into an objective state. The mystic, having had a certain experience of meditation, achieves a state in which the faculties that we know are suspended, yet the mystic himself retains the right to change this mystical suspension back again and to return again to objective physical consciousness. Therefore, he is not dead nor has he lost the power to control his own destiny. Some mystics have likened the situation to sleep inasmuch as the sleeper retains always the power to awaken himself. But he exercises this power when he is a in a condition of not knowing that he does so. Therefore, there must be and is something that retains a rational, or at least a conscious condition, after or beyond the suspension of objective consciousness. So we ask the mystic what this is, and we place him in a most unfortunate condition or position. For all mystics have been uniform in their simple admission that they cannot tell what it is. There has never been an adequate definition for samadhi. There has never been an, ab an adequate definition for nirvana, not one that is truly adequate. The individual who has reached this condition of existence, which is superior to thought, emotion, and action, is no longer able to define the condition that he is in. Out of various mystical writings, various traditions about these things, we can put together flashes of insight and fragments of revelation, but we have no adequate picture. One mystic will say, much as Dante did, that in this condition 
He was in the state of pure transcendent bliss. That everything was strangely, wonderfully, and inevitably right. Also, that everything was extraordinarily beautiful. And in some instances, we have descriptions of magnificent color pageantries. The universe unfolds into a magnificent spectrum of color that is not to be found anywhere in mortal existence. Among others, we find remarkable descriptions of sound, a tremendous outbursts of melody transcendent beauty of tone. Others seem to feel more and more that the universe into which they have suddenly ascended, so to say, is simply one of infinite life. That in this universe, everything is fully and completely and adequately alive that all the conditioned way in which we live seems to be death by comparison. The individual is without weight, without any sense of limitation or restriction. He is without the experience of the need to come or to go. He does not sense any requirement as peculiar to himself whatsoever. He simply is abiding in a, per in a perfection a wonderful, colorful, iridescent wonderfulness. As he proceeds in this thinking, the mystic who is by nature inclined, obviously, to piety, has the further sensing or experiencing within himself that in his spiritual bliss, in his absolute transcendent ecstasy, which carries with it no obvious or material pressures, no exhilaration or exuberance as we know it, but simply an absolute peacefulness, an absolute sufficiency, satisfaction of everything. That in all this, there is also this inevitable sense of the nearness of God. That in some way or other, this incredible peacefulness is God, that this wonderful eternal lifeness that experiences neither beginning nor end is God. This complete acceptance of life is the complete acceptance of God. And suddenly the person uh, is aware that this universe and all that manifests here is in some way in the keeping of an infinite sufficiency. That this sufficiency is a diffused aliveness. But the mystic also pauses in these contemplations and asks himself, or will be asked by others, in this state of apparently complete and inevitable unification with the infinite. How have you been able to preserve this record of your relationship to this uh, ecstasy? What has experienced the ecstasy? What is it that has stamped the mystical experience upon you so that when you return again to a common kind of existence, you find yourself inwardly filled with a continuing, lingering memory of this experience. This mystical experience happened to something. There had to be a cognition of it, or you could not have known it at all. We do not have a mystical experience that actually and factually ends in oblivion. We do not have the mystic finally say, I just wasn't anymore. He may say, I no longer exist. But he says it because something continued in him which permitted him to affirm his own non-existence. Thus, the, even though we go to the very depth of the mystery, we come finally to the point that Buddha makes. 
namely that all experience, human or divine, is possible only because there is something that can experience. And in the highest mystical experience that we know, which is the total sense of identity with God, there is still something that experiences this identity and is able to bring it back into a conditioned state, if not completely, at least partially. So we cannot simply go to the so-called boundaries of mentation or any element of our own nature that we can conceive of as ultimate. And having achieved this, assume that this ultimate is then a step into non-existence. This presents a very interesting and, and curious problem. It presents us with something our own minds are not capable of truly estimating. Therefore, we can only talk about things. We can only talk around experiences. But from those who have made the journey and have had the experience, we do have two evidences of importance. First, that they have come back. Therefore, they did not cease. That which ceases utterly does not come back. Furthermore, they have brought back some record of a condition of consciousness beyond our own. And this means that there had to be something that could experience and record this condition. It could not be diffused into space alone and come back again as a personal experience experienced by a person. Buddha probably came as near as anyone to attempting to bring this matter into orientation. He held it to be inevitable that the so-called self-nature of man exists on three levels. The lowest of these levels is the personality with which we are con uh, generally confronted. The second of these levels makes up the entire psychic or subjective organism of man and carries man uh, to the highest apex of an existence uh, which has been conditioned by external factors. No matter how, we, how high we carry the self, the self without capitalization, the self with the small s, no matter how far we carry this, we can only recognize that it is an entity or a being that has been integrated out of experience. The psychic life of the person is the, re is the result of the individual existing in the dimensional universe that we know. Therefore, there comes a time, and has to come a time, in which this consciousness, which exists within a conditioned universe, uh, can be brought to whatever perfection or completion is natural to itself. The individual has not achieved this as yet. But certainly the great processes of evolution, as carried on by the doctrines of rebirth and karma, do ultimately cause the individual to exhaust the material or physical or objective experiences of living. Theoretically, he must come in the end to the time in which the mind, which is a product of the reaction of sensory perceptions and their objects, receives the fullest allotment of power of which the mind is capable of receiving. Thus the person achieves the infinite measure of personality. He comes to the condition in which he is as nearly a complete person as he can possibly be. This person is an internal person. Theoretically, it is the self-knower. It is that which knows the self with the small s. And up to the present time, in our general thinking, we have never gone beyond that point. For the reason that 
To go beyond this means to cut away from landmarks which have any tangible value. The moment we leave the world of conditioned existence, we leave the self which has be been created by the experiences of conditioned existence. The mind is a conditioned instrument, a product of conditioning. The emotions constitute together a conditioned instrument, conditioned by feeling. The physical body is a conditioned instrument, created by the evolutionary processes by which all forms finally receive their, prob their problematic endowments. So we finally terminate man as a conditioned creature. And then what do we have left? What we appear to have left is, as Buddha tells us, is man himself, that in some mysterious way eludes all of these conditioned interpretations of his own nature. We can divest him of all conditions, yet he does not cease. We can take away from him all attitudes, yet he does not die. We can gradually cause uh, the suspension of every faculty, emotion, thought that we know of, and yet the individual, relieved of the pressures of all of these, does not totally cease to exist. This has to mean only one thing, that there is an existence completely superior to embodiment, an existence which is not embodied, an existence which is not involved directly in any of the involvements of condition. If this were not true, then man, developing his own resources, would ultimately come to the point where he could use resource to transcend the mental-emotional faculty pattern and retain rational awareness. This he cannot do. So we have to uh, finally divide this pattern, much as the Gnostics did, and recognize that there is not only uh, the world principle, il de boeuf, there is also a twofold superior nature uh, by means of which this lower world is animated. The Gnostics, in one school at least, called this upper duad of factors anthropos, and the son of Anthropos, the man and the son of the man. Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. And perhaps here we are in the presence of a further symbolism. For what do we generally call the highest part of man himself seems to be the psychic entity this mysterious causal root of our own uh, experience, so that somewhere at the summit of the experience of ourselves is the sense of the blessed experience of virtue, the experience of all things in their noblest and in their best. And these uh, things thus become, so to say, the fabric of our highest psychic or soul consciousness. This could well be the idea of Anthropos, the son of Anthropos. This is that part of man's existence which brings him as near as he can come to that existence which is beyond him. Perhaps uh, another way of approaching it, uh, much again in the Eastern theory, is to to say uh, that in addition to the inorganic form of life which we see around us and the organic form of life to which we belong, there may be a third form. This third form, which is distinct and different, this third form which can be 
a truly super organic existence. An existence, uh, however, that does not imply merely the pressing of the organic up to a higher level. There may be a level that is trans-organic, that has a complete existence apart from the two that we recognize as the kinds of life which fill the universe. There may be a third order of life. This third order of life could be as different from the lower as the two lower are from each other. It could represent an entirely different kind of existence, a different dimension of existence, making use of faculties or powers or energies or principles beyond anything that we can even imagine. Buddhism takes this position, particularly the northern school. It affirms that primarily that when man attains uh, to the summit of the small self, when he comes as far as he can come toward the totality of his own experience of himself, he suddenly comes to a point or condition in which there can be no further such experience. He is then confronted with a dilemma. Because beyond this point in which his own mind, being refined to its greatest possible degree, the mind is no longer able to even conjecture upon what is next. It is no longer able to bring any shadows of rationality out of this mysterious abyss of that which lies beyond itself. Yet the mind can only assume, therefore, that that which is utterly beyond its conception does not. face death with certain apprehensions, not certain as to its nature. But by wisdom we gain a strange confidence over death, as expressed by Jesus and Socrates, and expressed perhaps by little people more than we know, the individual who labors quietly, giving his life, spending it in the service of others moved perhaps by need or emergency to a gentle kind of martyrdom that we will never really appreciate. The majority of human beings, though they do not understand death, are not afraid to die. What perturbs them is the long, sometimes difficult process of dying. In the same way, man moving toward the void in the mystical sense, is not moving towards something utterly contrary to his nature. He is moving towards something for which the entire existence in a conditioned state must have been preparing him from the beginning. Out of this conditioned state, therefore, there must be fashion, that which is necessary to carry man into the unconditioned state, or into a paraconditioned state beyond his present understanding. It would appear, then, that the entire experience of evolution, while it gives man an infinite number of faculties and powers and, exper and expressions and experiences and conditions, is actually all of it moving toward the mystery of the void. It is moving the individual toward this infinite point of transition, which culminates all life-death experience as we know it. It also becomes reasonably obvious that somewhere in this experience the individual must let go of the final thing that remains to him, 
and that is this mysterious thread of selfness that extends into and through even the deepest meditations of the mystic. There is some time in which the individual must cease to struggle against the infirmity of existence, just as there comes a time at the end of physical life when the individual must quietly resign himself to the transition. Accepting all things, he must accept the transformation of himself into something else, or into some other condition or place different from his present understanding. Perhaps this is one way in which we learn the lesson, namely that every single embodiment through which we pass, by the very nature of itself and the nature of the faculties with which we must experience embodiment, leads us in the end, in every case, to the experience of the void, whether it be the small experience or the vaster one. Once, as Buddha points out, once the individual has stepped across between these two conditions, he cannot return. He cannot come back from the void, because something has to happen in that transition, by means of which he breaks the link between himself with the small s for self, and himself with the large S for self. He can return from the death of the body and be born again while the body principle continues to be active. He can rebuild his emotional bodies and he can rebuild his mental bodies in the processes of continual re-embodiment. But something has to happen when he steps into the mystery of the void. In that transition, the, the unit, the center, the focal point around which the total illusion of existence moves, this point is changed. If, as the ancient mystics affirmed, illusion is this foundation of separate existence, then if the illusion is completely removed, separate existence is removed also. Now, no one can really explain this matter except perhaps in terms of an arbitrary concept. But there may be the time when we will be able to trace it somewhat more effectively than we do now. Unfortunately, in these times, we are not trying to trace it. We are concerned only with our objective existence. If we had devoted half the energy to the conquest of ourselves, or the understanding of ourselves, that we have devoted to the effort to understand lesser things, we probably would at least have a greater insight into our own need and its ultimate solution. The southern school of Buddhism, the Hinayana, uh, was called the Lonely Road, inasmuch as it was the search for the void uh, as the immediate end of the life of the dedicated Arhat, or saint. It was the duty of the Buddhist mystic in the early or primitive system of Buddhism to reject and renounce all things, and taking upon himself a robe and a, and a begging bowl, to go forth to the extinguishment of his own personality. He must step by step tear down the mysterious involved structure that imprisoned him in the illusion of materiality. His only end, his only goal, his only purpose was final immersing of his entire nature in the void, the total extinction of himself in eternity. Now, it is amazing that such a doctrine would have had a great, powerful, important following. 
For it, is, it seems to be the most complete fatalism that is imaginable. How was it then that millions immediately rejoiced at this idea? The only answer to it has to be that somewhere within the deeper part of man there was the realization that this was true. That while the mind and the emotions could not justify the procedure at all, nor could any practical consideration as we know it support it, but somewhere inside of man, perhaps, there was this prim primordial or primeval realization that the entire economy of consciousness was pointing in this direction. There could be no other end. But when the northern school arose, uh, the lonely wanderer seeking only the extinction of himself was no longer acceptable. Perhaps it was due to the fact that the faith passed into the keeping of other nations, other races, other times other social groups with different basic attitudes toward the problems of life. These other groups, however, all agreed upon the same fundamental premise. At the end was the void. None of them changed this or modified it in any way. But the Northern School took the attitude that when the hour of decision comes, when the individual, having achieved enlightenment, contemplates the extinction of his own nature, that there should be a further contemplation, namely that having achieved what very few have ever accomplished, having come as near to eternity as man can come and live, having approached the void to the degree that it became a strange drawing power which seemingly reached out to grasp the individual and absorb him. Having attained this, it was the better part of compassion and charity and benevolence to turn back and to devote further conditioned existences to the service of those in greater need that there was therefore the rise of the bodhisattva ideal, the ideal of the saint or the sage who had reached the threshold of liberation but chose to return and help his fellow creatures to find their own difficult paths toward a better life. So the bodhisattva became the ideal. And in the presence of this ideal, the dim figures of the emancipated Buddhas uh, dropped back from the common experience of mankind. And in their place were the radiant teachers, those who had sacrificed eternity to labor for a while in the fields of time. This concept did not change the end, but it changed man's attitude toward the void. He changed his attitude toward the end of his own purpose. There was something in the old Hinayana that was selfish, man madly dashing after peace. And in the Mahayana, it seemed at least to many northern nations that perhaps were more uh, genuinely optimistic uh, than southern India, it occurred to them that this was the better way that the individual always had that choice, even as the, yoga and some, the yogi and samadhi has this choice. There seems to be a time or a point in which he can choose to go on or choose to come back. And that if he is a great lover of mankind, a great unselfish being, he will come back. Because of all men, he is now best fitted to lead others to the consummation of their needs. Thus the decision at the edge of the void became a very important philosophical principle. That the individual uh, either passed on into silence or returned. At the apex of this point of growth, 
The radiant figure of the Bodhisattva, however, stands not as an emaciated, emancipated ascetic. The Bodhisattva does not seem to be denuded of everything. It is not a struggling spark about to expire. It has not about it this sense either of exhaustion or of futility or of the utter renunciation of everything. It doesn't carry this impression at all. Uh, in both the northern and southern school, the saint, standing at the threshold of the Mahaparinavana, stands splendidly there. He stands mysteriously robed in grandeur. He stands in the vestments of sanctification. It is a, he is a glorious being, even though this glory is grounded in a complete humility so far as self is concerned. This very humility as an, has enhaloed him in a magnificent way. He becomes the object of the greatest religious art of the East and West. The truly sanctified person is splendid in wonder and in greatness, yet bows humbly in the presence of the truth it serves. So, whatever lies beyond the Bodhisattva, the radiant image, of graciousness, compassion, love, fellowship, peace. Whatever lies beyond can scarcely be less. We did not build this all up, growing in grace through life after life, gaining in insight from embodiment to embodiment, and gradually detaching ourselves from life as we physically know it to become ever more radiant, ever more wonderful, ever more strangely vestured in infinites, until we seem to approach almost the state of divine beings. Nor can we so envision from the subtle depths of our own nature such transcendency, unless there somewhere in the universe is a fact pertaining to it. And it would not seem that this consummation, then, is the end of something, is the final loss of all that has been gained, any more than we can assume that physical death at the end of a single life can be interpreted to mean the loss of all of that living, all of that struggle, all of that labor, cannot go down to sleep and never awake again. Nature's economy simply cannot permit this. Nature's processes do not justify it. Nature's own procedures are such that the fact of an immortal existence is forced upon us by the common experience of life. We need no miracle to press this into our consciousness. What is the peculiar quality of the Ahat standing on the threshold of liberation? or the Bodhisattva, resplendent in the vestments of the divine. What are the attributes of, the, of these beings? Perhaps these attributes suggest to us a strange long cycle returning again from the uh, innocence of infancy to the innocence of redemption. All through the middle grounds we have doubts and fears. Mencius, the great Chinese philosopher, tells us that the quality that enduring in us throughout all eternity is our final hope of glory is the childlikeness in ourselves. Perhaps it is true that we must be aware of the little children for of such is the kingdom of heaven. I think the peculiar quality that we sense or experience in the artistic representation of these semi-divine beings who represent only the attainment of a higher state within ourselves, 
that the qualities of these beings is a gradual reorganization of consciousness. That consciousness has gradually moved from the self-centeredness of mortality to the selflessness of immortality. Therefore, perhaps, there is the self-centered self, and there is also the selfless self. Perhaps what we are trying to realize is that this step across into the void is actually merely the continuance of a way of consciousness that we have begun to develop here, but that when this degree or way of consciousness reaches its maturity, we depart from here. That all we have here is a kind of of growing up of consciousness. And when it is mature, it departs into the void. That when things have reached their fullness and their ripeness, then they vanish behind the veil which divides the mortal sphere from the paranirvanic region. That everything grows up and vanishes that when our virtues become as perfect as we can make them, when our wisdom is as absolute as potential possibilities here permits, permit, then we move on. We move on into an entirely different dimension of existence. And in that other dimension of existence, there must be another dimension of self, the fact that we have this experience also means that at some time remote, at some way remote, this other dimension of self must also have been part of our primordial equipment. That it was this other dimension of self that precipitated the self with the little s. That in some way, after a certain time, we return again. Uh, to that condition uh, from which we departed. We return like the prodigal son to his father's house. We return again in this strange cycle which carries us into the darkness, through the great circle of the nirvanas, and finally brings us back again to the threshold of the causal world the world which we cannot express or cannot explain here. This is essentially, then, the concept that when we are finished here, we are starting somewhere else. We are not starting in the sense that we are beginning again in the strange physical darkness which marked the dawn of man's mortal existence, but we are moving into another condition, in which we have to have an entirely different group of instruments. Whatever that condition may be, the eternal principle within us must create another kind of self. It must create a, another kind of conditioned being of some nature to function there. Uh, we cannot assume uh, that the paranirvana simply means the universalization of our energy. The void becomes symbolic of the great sea of maya or illusion on the one hand, but it also becomes symbolic of Tao, which in its own nature is the very substance and life of God. Now we call that which is beyond the void God. Not because, actually, we are sure of this, but because we have run out of conditioned existences with which to associate the term. When we come to a point where all effects cease, and where we can only dimly perceive one abstract cause somewhere, that abstract cause has to be God. We can go no further. And God still remains the word to sum up our own unknown, the unknown of existence itself, which must be there, but which defies any definition we can ever bestow upon it. All of this then leads us 
gradually but sequentially and properly to the concept that there is this other kind of self that simply cannot be experienced in an ordinary way. And we come back again to the small self in our own life cycle. Tired, weary with existence, we come to the end of the mortal plan of things, and we enter into this strange mystery we call death. And there we remain for a little time, in this mysterious current of life itself. And then we mysteriously and dramatically move back again into the cycle of mortal existence. We open our eyes. We have no memory where we came from. We have no immediate consciousness of our purpose. We must gradually build again uh, the experience patterns which will adjust us to another way of life, we do not immediately have available any orientation. We simply open our eyes and here we are in a different condition. And in this different condition, we must build a life according to the potentials within us. Now, when we come into this condition, however, we do not come into it unconditioned. We bring into this condition a vast amount of previous conditioning. This previous conditioning gradually asserts itself, and little by little we become, uh, in, uh, we come again into possession of our natural inheritance. Thus, with different persons with different inheritances build different destinies in the various embodiments which make up our life cycle. Theoretically, if we reach a point of the bodhisattvic insight, we have reached the point where no further embodiment can contribute to the enlightenment of ourselves. By the time this stage is reached, we are in full conscious possession of the entire record of our former embodiment. We are in full conscious possession of all experience that has ever occurred to us. We have awakened in this last bodhisattvic life, moved by pressures that were going to break through, and were gradually going to give us the full accounting for the entire cycle of existence which stretched out so far into the past. Thus, as we open our eyes into this final embodiment, we come strangely and wonderfully equipped. Let us think for a moment what might happen if the individual, having reached the edge of the void, having reached the edge of the, of the cycle of embodiment, uh, should come to the point of the Mahaparanavana the point of no return. What might happen? He might voluntarily and willingly give up his life. He might give up his existence. He might say with the final and complete acceptance of the divine purpose, thy will be done. He might go forth into the void knowing only within his own consciousness one thing, and that is the utter and complete benevolence of the divine plan. In complete faith, in complete acceptance, he could step off into space. Not space now in the physical sense, but space in the sense of the dying out of his own selfness. He could experience the only ultimate death he could know, the death of that thing which knows that life exists. We can make this step. From this point on, nothing can be known about this being, at least nothing that we can ordinarily perceive. But what happens to this being? Is it possible that in that moment a new order of life opens to that being, that it is born into a different dimension? 
that it begins in this new dimension uh, with this fullness of experience that it previously had. That with an entirely different sense or set of factors, it could evolve, unfold, mature, and enrich without the existence of selfhood at all. Selfhood implies something. It implies an environment pressing in. It implies an internal inadequacy, struggling to survive. In the case of these beings, such cannot exist. Therefore, there has to be the kind of self that is not invoked by striving. There has to be the kind of a self that doesn't have to grow as we know growth. There may be other forms we know nothing of. But if this self steps into this vacuity, this emptiness. If Buddha's position is correct, it simply steps into a higher dimension of existence. In so doing, it reveals a higher dimension of its own nature. And for our purposes, and because of the way in which we are endowed, this new level of self would be a capital S. It would be in relation to us because it would represent man's identification with the divine. We don't really know what such a statement means, but we affirm that it does mean that the individual comes into identity with the state of God rather than with the state of man. That this identity of this in the state of God is another level of eternal consciousness that the individual has lifted himself from deity to the, the thinker to deity the conscious being. And that these various conditions of deity become great worlds in which processes and cycles of evolution take place. So the step across from the little self to the greater self has no necessary implication of actual annihilation. It has only the implication of the final breaking up of an attitude, which attitude is not necessarily real and is certainly only valuable in a world such as we inhabit. So there could be an entirely different type of existence, an existence as strange to us today as our existence might be to the worms, an existence which they cannot even conceive. Man cannot conceive the life consciousness of little things. He cannot understand or share in the life of the countless forms of organic existence that surround him at all times. They are too small, too difficult, too distant in quality. These, in turn, cannot understand man. Their problems, their existences, are entirely with a different focus. It is quite possible that these different levels do not end with man, but that as man is above other levels, so there are other levels above men, and that all the mysterious zones and spheres of ancient cosmogony could well represent the extension of a universe of consciousness, and that in this universe, man evolves certain natures. In our, in our material world, he has involved a peculiar central focus, which he calls the ego. Evolution has given him up to this time an intensive concept of I am-ness. It has caused to emerge from all the mysterious chemistry and alchemy of his own processes this concept, I am I. This sense of central being. We cannot define it adequately, but we certainly experience the sensing of it. There might be another kind of existence in which there is no precipitation of a centralized being. No need for it. That rather, instead of a centralized being, we might participate in the experience of a generalized being. Yet this generalized being might not mean a diffusion of ourselves by a strange adulteration in space, 
we might not simply disappear in some strange abstract fluidic essence. It is perfectly possible that the individual can have a motion towards a complete generalization of consciousness that can be just as valid, just as real, as the concentration of consciousness. That seems to be Buddha's point of view, namely that what we term the extinction of illusion is the end of something that we believe to be real, but that it has nothing to do with survival, per se. It has only to do with the survival of our own attitude toward survival. If this attitude changes, if this attitude ceases, then we face an entirely different challenge of survival. But the loss of the instinct to remain as we are does not necessarily imply that the only alternative is extinction. What perhaps we are really faced with is the motion from a negative state in which ignorance presses us toward a state of consciousness, so that what we are building up, what we call trial and error, is merely a pressure due to ignorance, that the individual is inadequate. Therefore, he depends for his growth upon the pressures of circumstances upon him, or as some might say, he grows by suffering. He grows by being the victim of conditions which he must struggle desperately against, which he must rise above by a victory of morality or integrity over circumstances. Thus he is actually being molded by a negative procedure. The most that he can hope uh, from this negative molding is that in the end he shall attain the power to survive in the conditioned existence in which he now lives. Yet we have no assurance that this is the final condition of anything. We have no assurance that if the individual lived perfectly in this world, that this perfection would be the ultimate end of anything. Therefore, the uh, Buddhist point of view and the mystic point even of view even among early Christian mystics was finally that there must be a time when evolution was no longer man growing because he had to, but that the time must come when man would unfold because he internally knows why and how, that growth would be a voluntary, positive adjustment with existence, and that growth would therefore be the unfolding or the developing or the ripening of the fruit of the tree of consciousness, that the individual would not uh, grow because of the laws around him, but would grow because of the insight within him. Now, this kind of world in which we live now would be useless to him under such circumstances. In fact, would be a detriment, if anything. The individual's opportunity to unfold must be in a dimension of life suitable for this kind of growth, this kind of instruction. So we can assume, perhaps for a moment, that in this the, the symbolism of the Buddhist lotus has been very adroitly used. Man mysteriously has existed in the bottom of a pool. His roots have gradually dug deeply into the wet earth, the slime, the mud, the elos, from which life crawled. For it is said in ancient Greece that the first empire was Helium, which was the world of mud. And gradually, through great effort, <clears throat> the human soul, the consciousness of man, has grown up through the mud, through the water, and has finally come to the surface of the pool. And as it comes to the surface of the pool, the leaves spread out in beautiful circular dish-like forms, and the bud appears. <coughs> Finally, the bud bursts into blossom, opens, showing all the magnificence of the glorious white, yellow, or blue flower. 
untouched in its purity of blossom by the strange dark mud in which its roots are placed. The Buddhist illumination is represented in a mysterious way, but perhaps this is the symbol. The surface of the water is the surface which divides our present existence from the mystery of the void. For those creatures living in the bottom of the well, to come forth out of that mud and water would be to die as a fish taken out of its element. Therefore, to that which is unprepared, this transition is a terrible and dangerous thing. But for the lotus, which was fashioned for this purpose, the revelation of itself means that it grows up through mortality and blossoms upon the surface of the void. This blossom really represents the birth of, of the larger consciousness concept, that actually what we would call passing into the uh, ultimate samadhi or into the Mahaparanavanic state would be that from this side, from this appearance, something disappears, something seems to cease, our friend is gone not by the common emergency of death, by a, but by an extraordinary transition from which there is no return. But above, above the surface of the void, a different perspective, perspective might show that at that moment when this thing seemed to cease, above the blossom opened. The being came into flowering in a world suitable for flowering which is not this one. For in this world, things seem to flower, but they nearly always die before the blossoms are perfected. So in this other concept, the flower bursts forth into its true bloom, into its true fruitfulness, only after it has risen into the void. This would be the Buddhist concept pretty clearly stated. And that in this opening of the lotus bud into the flower, another self, our sattva, is revealed. This is perhaps even more than the bodhisattva. This is the perfect Buddha. This is that which has finally transcended this condition and come into an entirely new dimension of life. Somewhere in this upper dimension, which we call the unknown, and which is merely our name for the void, somewhere there must be the foundations of consciousness, the foundations of self, the foundations of being. And the creature never knows this potential locked within it. It never finds this true self while it is here. But when it reaches into that world, which is the abode of a better self than it has ever known, then that better self manifests its own nature. Whether this is a final manifestation, we do not also know. Whether this process of endless growth goes on further, we can only speculate. But one thing is certain for, as, for our experience, that all of the conditioned existence which we now experience is suspended from a, con a superior condition. Therefore, that the conditioned self we know is suspended from a more universal self, which we cannot know until we have manifested it in our own experience. And this higher self, this self with a capital S, can only be experienced after we have transcended the nature of our present uh, chemical pattern of constitution. That which will ultimately be revealed was archetypally present. The seed of the lotus self is already in us. This seed, however, will not blossom while we are bound within the three dimensions that we know. Because of itself, 
It is a thing of higher dimensions. It can only come when we are able to sustain a state of consciousness which is not available to us as yet. But we are working toward it. And when the proper time comes, we will experience it and we will know the meaning. We will then realize that this self in some way is locked within the seed of the present self, but that this present self must break asunder, releasing the life within it. For unless the seed die, surely it shall not live again. Thus is written in the scriptures. Therefore, unless the self, which is the seed of our immortality, is planted in the earth, unless it dies symbolically, this other superior thing cannot grow out of it. For the lotus upon the surface of the void is surely locked within the seed of our present imperfection. We transcend imperfection and in so doing bring this larger self-glory into its state of blossom. These are only words about things, but about all we can do is use words and hope that in some mysterious way these words have essences which touch the primordial convictions of our souls, and that in some way from these words certain consolation, certain uh, contact with value uh, will be at least suggested. Um, this is about as far as we can take a very abstract subject, so I think it's about time to stop and let everyone go home. And thank you very much for being with us for this series.